Hello everyone, welcome to A plus BI. This channel is all about complex numbers and in this video, we're going to be solving a complex problem. It's not that complicated, so don't worry about it. If you're new to complex numbers, go ahead and check out my lecture videos. I go over the basics of complex numbers and always ask questions. That's the best way to learn. Now, if you're interested in number theory, algebra and trigonometry, a little bit of geometry, you can go ahead and check out my other channel my very first channel, Cyber Math, Cyber with an S. Great, let's go ahead and take a look at this problem. I'll go over some basics, but first, I just wanna think about it from a real perspective. Like if you had a question like, let's say, and I is a constant, by the way, before I forget, let me tell you, I is the square root of negative one, so you can also say I squared equals negative one, okay? Now, if you look at this from a real perspective, what would you do? Let's say you had something like three to the power z equals five, right? I is a constant, E is a constant, by the way. E is Euler's number, which is about 2.7, uh, which comes up in logarithms, you know, and as an exponential function. It's just amazing because Euler is amazing, right? The most beautiful equation came from there, so on and so forth. So what would you do if you had a problem like this? And a lot of times people say, oh, the way you lecture is kind of confusing because you're going from one problem to the other. I just want to show you a sample. This is not our problem, warning. This is a different problem. But what would you do if you had a problem like this, right? Sometimes a problem solving strategy is solving an easier problem. So to get an idea, to get an understanding, it's, it might be helpful, right? To look at this problem. If you say like, okay, three, to the power z equals five, it's impossible because five is not a power of three. Well, if z is an integer, you're right. But if not, then you're wrong, <laughs> too bad. So what would you say in this case? You would probably say something like, okay, log both sides. And which base? That would be the follow-up question. And then the answer will be, it doesn't matter. Log as base 10, or you can use ln for natural log or any other base is fine. I mean, base three would probably make a lot of sense because three is the base right? But then you would just continue with properties of logarithms. You would bring the z down and then from here you would get the solution. And depending on what you, which base you use, obviously you would get different solutions or different looking solutions. They're all the same equivalent by the way. But that would be the solution to this equation, right? So why not do the same thing, right? I mean, what is the difference between the real world and the complex world, right? So let's just copy that method and we have i to the z equals z. The only difference is i is imaginary, but let's just still do it. So again, the question is, which base would you use, right? And I would say natural log, why not use ln, right? So let's go ahead and use that. So I'm gonna go ahead and ln both sides and then ln e is one, as you know, and then we can bring the z over here, z times ln i, E equals one because ln e is one, remember? And from here, automatically it should follow, right? Z equals one over ln i. Wait a minute. What is ln i? That's the next question. The million dollar question. One of the million dollar questions, right? How do you ln a logarithm, um, I mean, imaginary or complex number? Well, there are ways to do it. So first you need to understand we can write a complex number in polar form like this. Z, any complex number Z can be written as R times E to the I theta. Now there are two things here. R is the modulus or the absolute value and theta is the angle or the argument, okay? And this basically means that if you plot a complex number like this, this is Z, you'll end up with two things. The distance from zero which is the modulus, which can also be written as the absolute value of z. And you'll get an angle, but this angle has a direction. The positive direction is the counterclockwise. So always remember in the unit circle or any type of setup like this, argon plane, counterclockwise is positive. Clockwise is negative, okay? That's it. And this is called the imaginary axis and this is the real one. Great. So. Since we can write any number like this, can't we just ln both sides? Yeah, I mean, you should be able to do it. ln z from here then, ln r times e to the i theta, 
and that would turn into ln r plus ln e to the i theta, which is i theta. So a lot of times people would write this differently. Some textbooks, maybe most textbooks, some kind of exceptional here, not necessarily in a good way, but I'm just saying I make exception. They will write it as log because they say that's a complex logarithm. So you can use ln, but I'm pretty sure there are textbooks or resources that use ln instead of log. But anyways, you'll probably see it and I don't want you to be confused. But this one is particularly ln because r is a number that is greater than zero and you don't even want it to be zero because you can't ln zero even in the real world or complex world. So this is a real valued ln. That's why you can use, it's a real valued logarithm. That's why you can use ln. Does that make sense? So there's a distinction, but they kind of mean the same thing. They don't, but they do. Anyways, I hope that wasn't too confusing, but you can do that. And when you do, something interesting happens. Yay, I can ln a complex number and just replace z with i, and you should get something like ln i equals ln absolute value of i. So the question is, what is the absolute value of i? Well, i is right here on the imaginary axis, and it's one unit away from zero. Why? Because it's one i. It's like the unit, our unit is i, okay? So it'll be ln one, because that's its modulus, r is one, plus i theta, and theta is measured in the positive direction, remember counterclockwise, that would be pi over two. Of course, this is kind of like a simplification. You know why? Because theta can take infinitely many values. What happens if I add two pi to this? That brings you to the same point, but that just becomes pi over two plus two pi. Or you can do pi over two minus two pi, minus four pi. In other words, you can add multiples of two pi to it. So if you want the general solution, then you would probably add something like two pi n, where n is an integer. But if you want the, what's it called? The principal value, then you can replace n equals zero, and that'll give you the principal value, okay? That's how you can find the principal value of the argument, or the principal argument, and the principal value of the logarithm. So in other words, log of a complex number, or the complex log, is multi-valued. It's not single-valued, okay? So that's what makes a huge distinction between this world of real numbers and complex numbers. I'm not saying I'm familiar with the complex world. I'm just learning along the way, okay? Especially from your comments. Some of you are professors, some of you are experts, PhD students, who knows, right? I mean, a lot of people um, contribute to the community. Anyways, you get the idea, and that's the ln of i. So what am I gonna do with that though, right? <laughs> exactly, you're just gonna place ln i with that, and you'll get the solution. We could also get to this in a different way. Let me show you, because there's more than one way to do it. Maybe that's your first method, and here's the second method, and then at the end, we can go ahead and compare our results. Even though I didn't write out the first one, you can hopefully do that, because I, I'm feeling lazy almost always. So the second method looks like this. First of all, before we get into the second method, I just wanna talk about a couple things, which I believe is important. What would happen if you had an equation like this? And I've done the same mistake in the past. I apologize, and I probably let you know about it and made a new video that shows that this is not possible. Why is this not possible? What's the problem with that? Well, one, any power of one is always one. So you can't get E from there. But the million dollar question is then, can you get E from I? Yes, I is not one even though its modulus is one, its absolute value is one. So is that a problem? Let's go ahead and explore a little bit more, shall we? Now, we're gonna use the polar form for this, the exponential form. I, we know that has a modulus of one, so we're not, we don't need that. So r e to the i theta turns into i theta if r is one, right? Obviously that kind of follows. So this is gonna be written as e to the power i times pi over two. But again, for the same reason, I need to add multiples of two pi. So let's do that. You know what, we can always get rid of it. It's better to write it in the general form then we can kind of go into specific forms, okay? Now, the right-hand side is just E, right? So we can just write it as E. Some people say that, hey, you know what? You need to attach complexified version of one, which is E to the power two pi ki. 
Now, what is going on here? What do you mean by the complexification of life? This is too complicated, right? Well, one can always be written as e to the power of 2 pi ki. Because if you think about the argon plane again, now you have one right here, one unit away from zero, and its modulus is one, obviously, that's why I don't need an r, but I do need the theta. And what is theta? Theta is either zero radians or two pi radians or negative two pi radians, whatever. But the thing is, it is a multiple of two pi. That's why this represents one. You see, it's the complex version of one, the exponential version. So when I do that, this is gonna be e to the power one, and I'm gonna be getting something like this. Does this make sense at all? Or do we not need the other? I don't think we do need it, but I'm just gonna leave it there for you to explore a little bit more. But in this case, if we did need it, then we could safely say that, okay, i times pi over two plus two pi n equals one plus two pi ki. Then I can go ahead and, oops, where's the z? I lost z if we're doing the process. Sorry about that. I forgot to include the z here. It should be a factor. So z will come up here. Yes, okay. Sorry, I, sorry. I did a little bit of hocus pocus abracadabra there. But that's z. And now what I can do is I can basically divide both sides by this, right? which kind of looks complicated, but we can simplify it. But I'm gonna go ahead and simplify this and compare it to the first method, because with the first method, remember what we did? We used the ln, right, directly. Now, I have a feeling that this is not gonna be there, but again, I'm gonna leave it open. And we can multiply the top and the bottom by negative two i. I think that'll do it at once, right? Negative uh, two i. We'll do two things. First of all, it'll give you a negative 2i, and then here negative 2i squared is going to be a positive 2, so it's going to be plus 4 pi k. And in the denominator, uh, when you multiply these two things, it's going to give you negative i 2i squared, which is positive 2. And when you distribute to 2, you're going to get pi plus 4 pi n. So I have a feeling that k should be 0. If k is 0, then you get z equals negative 2i over pi plus 4 pi n. And if n is also 0, then you get the simplest form, negative 2i over pi. And guess what? This is something you can substitute into this equation and see if you're going to get e from here. Of course, you need to write i in polar form again. But if you go back to the first method, which one agrees with the first method? Again, I'm going to leave it as an exercise because this brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe. Take care. Don't forget to check out CyberMath and A plus BI. And bye-bye.